love is of God. If you love, you're born of Him. Love washed away the multitude of sin. Check. How y'all doing? If you have a Bible, you can take it and go to Psalms, Psalm 40, if you like. What happens when you're faced with a decision? And that decision is lining yourself up with God's will. There are going to be times in your life that you're going to come across situations where your will isn't necessarily God's will. And there's going to be times in your life where you're going to have to get to a place where you make a decision. Do you want to do what you want to do? What pleases you? Or are you willing to bend your will to God's will? The greatest example of that is Jesus Christ. I can guarantee you that Jesus Christ did not want to suffer the way he wanted to suffer. As a matter of fact, he prayed unto the Father three times. If this cup can be removed from me, remove it. There's not another prayer that I'm aware of in the life of Jesus Christ where he says, if something else can be done, I don't want to do this, do it. That's the only thing that I'm aware of in the Word of God that he prayed three times that he did not want to go through it. But at the end of the day... He submitted unto the Father's will, fully understanding and realizing what he had to go through. And he did that because he loves us. And he wanted to please his Father. In Psalm 40, there's a psalm that has a meaning when it was written by the great psalmist David. And it had the meaning in the prophetic future regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 and forward, this verse is referred to, and there you can see that it was referring to to Jesus Christ, okay? But there's a wonderful lesson in these verses where it says, I delight to do thy will. Do you delight to do God's will? I'm not talking about doing God's will and going kicking and screaming like some kids. You know, the mother's got to grab the kid away from the toys and pull them down the store aisle. Do you actually delight, do you enjoy, do you take pleasure in learning about God and then doing His will? That's what the psalmist said here, I delight in doing thy will. It says, "My law, thy law is within my heart. And that's a hard thing to accomplish in these days. To get the word of God in your heart. Because once you have the word of God in your heart, It'll always be there. But the job is to get the Word of God in your heart. Because the world is fighting to keep the Word of God out of your heart. And sadly enough, the church, the professing Christian church, is fighting to keep the Word of God out of your heart also. They want the Word of the modern culture You know, when is Columbus Day? The 12th. They canceled Columbus Day. 
They're calling it by some ridiculous name now. And you know why they did that? Because they bent their wills to the wills of the cancel culture, to the wills of the quote-unquote woke people. See, the Bible says we are to bend our wills to the will of God, but it's all backwards. It's Columbus Day, and it'll always be Columbus Day, no matter what they name it. The scripture says, I delight to do thy will. The word delight means to take pleasure. It actually, it means, one of Strong's definition is, it, it means to bend, to bend. That means when it comes to a choice, and you feel a certain way, and we have opinions about certain things, and we read in God's word that this is what God's opinion is, we have to be willing to bend our opinion to line up with the will of God if we want to please God. The more selfish man is, the less he will do this. The more he will kick back against God, the further away he will move, and he will develop and manufacture his own rules and regulations and laws to please him. The problem with that is they're no good because the word of God is pure. The word of God is yea and amen. The word of God doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right? You can sneak up anytime you want in the morning and crawl and look into Proverbs 3, 5, and Proverbs 3, 5 will say the same thing for the rest of your life. It's said the same thing for thousands of years. You know why? Because God said it. And when God said it, it was right, it was perfect, it was done. Man doesn't, isn't like that. Man makes a law today, and you know what he's doing a week from now? He's revamping the law because he forgot something or because he wants to include something or because the culture doesn't like what he says, so he has to reword something. And man's laws, rules, and regulations are in constant flux, change, because man... It's not God, but man plays God today. Look at Psalm 143. The psalmist said that he delights to do thy will, and that the law, the word of God, was in his heart. In Psalm 143, in verse 10, it says, Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good, lead me into the land of uprightness. Okay? You have to be taught what the will of God is. And the only way you can be taught what the will of God is, is from this book. The word of God. And most people don't read the word of God today. They read devotionals. They listen to their pastor, they listen to teachings, but they don't crack the book. You have to learn what the Word of God says for yourself, because if you don't learn for yourself, you're going to be hoodwinked, and someone's going to come down with a new and exciting doctrine, and your ears are going to tickle, and you're going to be led away. You have to know what the Word says, and then you have to be able to have a backbone to stand on God's Word and let nobody talk you out of God's Word. No one touches the Word of God in your life. Not your wife, not your husband, not your pastor. Nobody. The Word of God is number one. It has to hold that place in your heart and in your life. And if it doesn't, you will pay for it. For something else will be number one. The Bible describes that as idolatry. And you have to take the time to make God's Word. You have to fight for God's Word today. Because everything in the world is fighting against God's Word. Everything in the world is speaking contrary to God's word. And they keep pounding it into your ears. They pound it into your eyes. They pound it over and over and over again. They hit you with peer pressure. The world view of the world is not a godly world view. 
And when someone endeavors to speak about God and live a godly worldview, they are looked down like there's something wrong with them. That's how the world goes. But one man or one woman with the word of God is more powerful and more important to God than the whole world without it. Because you and God make a majority. And you need to believe that and you need to act accordingly. Teach me to do thy will for thou art my God. The God of this world is teaching his disciples how to do his will. Okay? Starting with Washington. To get all of these laws enacted and all of these bills passed that are contrary to the word of God. I see people walking around in parks with nobody near them with a mask on. And I got nothing against a mask because if someone wants me to wear a mask to go into their store, that's their store. I'll put the mask on to bless them. But these people have no brains. They have zero brains. They're walking in a 50-acre park alone and they got a mask on. Now that's just stupid. And that is the result of the fear that's coming from the world. Constant fear, fear, fear. Telling you to be stupid. I'm not telling you to be careless. If you choose to get a vaccine, get a vaccine. That's your business. I'm not going to tell you one way or another because I'm not a medical doctor. But don't tell me you're going to put a mask on and walk in a 50-acre park and that's going to protect you from something. It might protect you from a bug. See? But this is the fear that's put in the people. And then they turn around and they call the unvaccinated spreaders and all these other things. And I guess never got to thinking that if the vaccine is so powerful and the vaccine is so effective, why should you say anything to anybody that's unvaccinated? Because you are saved. You can't get touched. You can't get hurt by if they carry something because you have the almighty vaccine. So why are you yapping at them? You're protected. Look, look, if I got a gun and I got a dog, I'm protected. If you come in my house, it's going to go bad for you. I'm not going to say, oh, just because you guys are robbing, that's what putting me in danger. I'm not in danger. You're in danger. Okay? But nobody thinks that way. Look at Matthew chapter 6. You have to be taught what God's will is so you can choose whether you're going to do it or not then you're going to have to bend your will to his will. Matthew 6, verse 9 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Okay. I can guarantee you from the accuracy of God's word, that God's will is done in heaven. Okay? The last time God's will was challenged in heaven, Lucifer got himself booted out. Okay? God's will gets done in heaven. If God says, this is what I want, that's what happens. If God calls Gabriel up and says, I'd like you to do such and such, he says, fine, it's my pleasure to do so and so. If God calls a celestial being and says, I'd like you to go here, or a cherubim, or a cerebin, this is what he says, it gets done. Problem is, they listen up there. The problem is, down here, we don't. Because we know better than God, and we want to do our own thing. And you can see the result of the world, because we are separating ourselves from God, and we want to do our own thing. If the world was budgeting right, if the world was curing things, if murder was down, if rape was down, if drugs were down, if the debt was down, then you got an argument. Okay? But it's not. Everything is up, 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 and keeps going up. And you know what they say? We got it. We're going to fix it. I'll wait till the Republicans get in. They're going to fix it. I'll wait till the Democrats get in. They're going to fix it. 
I'll wait till the Republicans get back in. They're going to fix it. Nobody's going to fix it. The Bible says evil men wax worse and worse. It's going to get worse and worse. And we live in that end time period where it's getting worse and worse. And if the Lord should tarry, our children have to go through this. It's going to be worse for them. Second Timothy, please. This section of scripture I'm going to share with you briefly tonight will explain to you the reality of what spiritual warfare is all about. And one of the greatest mistakes a ministry can make is to dismiss the reality of spiritual warfare or to lessen that reality and compare it in a metaphor or any other figure of speech you want to use to an athletic competition. That's devilish. And the understanding of this, what I'm going to share with you now, if you get what I'm going to share with you now, it will undo some wrong teaching that you may have heard throughout the years. And it will give you a clear perspective and a precise understanding of what is actually going on in the spirit realm. Now, Timothy was a young man of God. He was Paul's student. He was Paul's minister. And when Paul was to pass the reins of the church, the baton, so to speak. He was going to lay it on the shoulders of this young man, Timothy. And any time that responsibility is laid on your shoulders, that's a big job to undertake. So in instructing him of future events and what's going to happen when he's ministering and moving and functioning in his ministry... Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's a tremendous truth. He says, be strong in the grace. He could have said a lot of things. Because isn't the love of God wonderful? Is it the mercy of God, the compassion of God? How about the power of God? All these other things. But he said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now this is the great Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul learned a lesson about grace. Okay? The Apostle Paul did a lot of things. And in the book of Corinthians, he was taken up and he was shown a vision about the third heaven and the third earth and he was not able to utter those words back to the people on earth. God said, it's just for you to know, keep your mouth shut about it. And because of the abundance of revelation and because of the abundance of what God did in the life of the Apostle Paul, the Bible says Satan sent a messenger, a thorn in the flesh, to buffet him. And Paul besought the Lord three times to take this away. And you know what God's answer was for the thorn? It was, my grace is sufficient unto you. Right? Is it any wonder the great lesson he learned that day in dealing with problems, in dealing with tribulations, in dealing with trouble, the Lord's answer was, my grace is sufficient unto you. See? And the tense of the verb is perfect. So this is what it means. I have given you grace once and for all, that will take you through the rest of your life. It's a completed, done job. It's the same tense where it says that Jesus Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished. It's in the perfect. In other words, there was no more that could be done. It was done once and for all in the past and it's enough and there's nobody else coming to redo anything else. The grace that God gave the Apostle Paul was enough to take care of any problem. And you already got it. And Paul learned that lesson. Because Timothy, this is what he says. Be strong in the grace that is in what? Christ 
Christ Jesus. He was passing that lesson on to this young minister because he knew that this young minister would have many thorns in the flesh. He knew that this young minister would go through much tribulation and trials. And he was preparing this young minister. And he says, I know the secret. I know the key. I know how you can bear up under the pressure that you're going to go through, young man. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's what the Apostle Paul said. See? He didn't pick the word because he didn't know any other words. He picked that word because God told him. And God showed him in his own life. And he was able to share it with that young minister. And it's a wonderful thing when you have an older pastor, an older minister, who has a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of knowledge that can impart it to you, instead of having to have to hold the road yourself. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He said, remember who taught you. He said, remember what I taught you. And you teach faithful men. Teach faithful men the same principles I taught you. The same truths I taught you. So that they in turn can teach what? Others. Others. And when you have the truth of God's word, and you have the accuracy of God's word, you remember what you were taught. When the Bible says... That there's only two genders, a male and a female. And your preacher stands up on a Sunday morning and says, I got woke last night. And now there's seven or eight or nine or 15 genders or they're fluid. Or it's okay to be a homosexual now. It doesn't matter what God says about it. It was a misunderstanding. It was a mistranslation. The Hebrew didn't read right. We didn't have enough scholars. That's not a faithful man. That's not passing the truth from, of God's word from one generation to another. In just one generation, if I sat down, I could probably document 50 great lies in the professing Christian church today. That's not faithful men. That's not remembering the truth. That's not remembering who taught you. Oh, there is room for development. There is room for expansion. There is room for further teaching and understanding. Okay? But there are certain principles in God's Word that don't change. That's all that's to it. Thou, verse 3, and here's the verse. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And there it is. And you can study the words out in the Greek. They mean warfare. They mean soldier. They mean one who's going on a campaign. Okay? He is telling Timothy to learn how to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. To endure hardness is to suffer evil, to endure evil, to endure afflictions, to endure troubles. God does not send suffering and pain and sickness to people to better them. That is a lie that some in the Christian church teach. God is always good. He is light. And in Him there is how much darkness? No darkness. God is love. God is faithful. God is kind. God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is forgiving. God is pure. Now let me teach you something. Anyone who has served in the military knows the risks you accept when you engage an enemy. 
when your commander says to you, I need someone to take that hill, secure it until reinforcements arrive. You know what's going to happen if you volunteer or if you're chosen to take that hill. You know that there's going to be a chance, a good chance, that you're going to encounter a hostile force. And when the enemy starts shooting, and you need to navigate through a slurry of IEDs or landmines, who in their right mind goes back and blames the commander for the problems that are associated and that they faced during that warfare? And say, this is your fault. You sent this to me. Anybody? No. No. The only way that you would do that is if you had bad intel. God never gives bad intel. Okay? You know, you have to take an oath called an enlistment oath. When I went to the army, I had to take an oath. This is the army's enlistment oath. I, Nick Catania, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the uniform code of the military justice, so help me God. That's the oath that you take when you enlist in the Army. The other service branches are similar. Okay? Now when you take that oath, okay, you realize that it's not all going to be peaches and cream. You might get something called deployed into a war zone. And when you get deployed into a war zone, okay, and in my day it was an M16, I don't know what they're using today, they give you a weapon. You dare not call it a gun. It's a weapon. They teach you how to throw a hand grenade. They teach you how to shoot a 45. They teach you how to use an M16 and take it apart and clean it and put it back together. And they teach you how to kill the enemy. Okay? That's what they do. So when you go there and you're engaging the enemy and bullets are coming at you and you're shooting and you get hit, you don't turn around and blame your sergeant and say, why are you doing this to me? Because you already know that you signed on the dotted line. And you already know that you are engaged in a physical warfare. And you expect that to happen. And because you are a person of courage and honor, you serve your country. And that, my friends, is what happens in spiritual warfare. But Christians don't have the brains they were born with. Because when they get hurt, or when pressure comes to them, or they catch a cold, or they catch a sickness, you know what they teach them? Oh, God is using that to humble you. BS! That's BS. You are being attacked because you are engaging in spiritual warfare, and that is the enemy. The Bible says Satan sent a messenger to Buffett Paul. It doesn't say God sent him. The Bible says Satan sent sore boils on Job. It doesn't say God sent them, but everybody wants to blame God. That's like blaming the president. That's like blaming the general. That's like blaming your lieutenant. Hey, I need someone to go up to that hill. Okay, you know what's going to happen. And when you get shot at, you don't say it's your lieutenant shooting you. You don't blame your lieutenant for putting you in that position. You signed on the line. But people do not understand spiritual warfare. Okay? And it's the lack of that understanding 
that when something happens in their life, they're real quick to blame God or to make a fabricated excuse to say, well, God is using this to prove me and test me to make a better Christian out of you. How many of you here have children? Would you pour acid on that child to make a better child out of it? What kind of mother, what kind of father does stupid things like that? An insane one. Would you wake that child up and beat it senseless to make it a stronger child? But this is what we say about God. Would you inject COVID into that child just so the child could pray to you for healing? But this is what we say because we don't understand. And you know who's laughing all the way? The devil. The devil. Look, if God sends sickness, don't you dare pray to him to take his will away from your life. If that is his will for your life to make you more humble, then you should pray for more sickness so you can become real humble. Instead of praying, take this away from me, pray, heal me. God doesn't need you or doesn't need to play with you like these Greek mythology gods. And they're going to torture. Oh, let's see what he has here. Let's see what he does there. That's not our God. That's a bad rap. Our God is loving. Our God is good always. Good always. And you know what else our God is? He's common sense. He's common sense. And if you, being a mother or a father, can take good care of your child, and you wouldn't even think about injecting the child with sickness or COVID or any of these other things, what makes you think that you're a better mother or father than God? What makes you think you're a better parent than God? That's stupid. But this is what people think. You know why? Because they don't understand the devil. Because he hides himself, himself from them. They don't have the knowledge of the spirit realm. And they do not realize that they're engaged in spiritual warfare. It's not an athletic competition. A soldier doesn't throw a football at someone who got a 60 caliber, a 50 caliber. You understand? You know how much damage that does to the person with the 50 caliber? Nothing. They laugh at you. People die in spiritual warfare. The devil is the author of death. People get sick. People get destroyed. People lose things in spiritual warfare. They don't go home and say, I lost the game. Let's pop a beer and sit down. See, they lessen it. They don't understand. And then they don't prepare the people to engage in spiritual warfare. And when the people get their tails kicked, some of them turn around and say, well, God's doing it to me to make me humble. B.S. The devil kicked your tail because you don't understand what you're engaged in. Well, endure hardness as a good soldier. As a good soldier. Any soldier knows what it is to endure hardness. And then we have the elite soldiers. We have the army rangers. We have the 82nd Airborne. We have the Navy SEALs. We have the Marines. Do you think those guys know how to endure hardness? Go through hell week to become a Marine. They'll teach you what it is to endure hardness. But you know what? They sign on because they want to wear the uniform because there's honor and pride and dignity in the uniform. And when something needs to be done, you know who gets called up? Somebody who can do it. And they're willing to put their life on their line. They're willing to get shot. They're willing to get blown up. They're willing to get whatever because they signed up and this is what we do. And that's the same with the church. And if the church doesn't have that mentality, the church sits on their rocking chairs and listens to all this puke coming out of these pastors teaching them all this garbage and they're lied to. Jesus Christ is not magnified anymore. Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven anymore. You can be a girl, it's okay. You can be a guy, it's okay. You can be a cocker spaniel the next day if you want. That's not what the Word teaches. And the pastors, for the most part, don't have what they were born with to stand behind the lectern and teach the truth. And you know why? Because they're afraid they're going to get canceled. 
Nobody ever died from getting canceled. Okay? Nobody. God cares more about three people, three people on a park bench talking about the truth of his word than he does a 10,000 congregation church that doesn't have the truth of his word. That's right. He does. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not compete. We do not go to contest. We do not, what's it say? War. And you know what it means? War. We do not war after the flesh. Now Paul was a smart man. He could have used a lot of words. But this is what God told him to write. We do not war after the flesh. For our weapons, for the weapons of our warfare, just to make sure. You're talking about a what? A warfare. It's not a cardinal warfare. Christians are fighting cardinal warfare today. That's why they're losing. Because they don't understand the spirit realm. Not cardinal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. No man that what? Warreth. Warreth. Look it up in the Greek, you don't believe me. It's a military term. Warreth. Entangles himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who had chosen him to be a what? Soldier. Soldier. Pleasing God. Do you want to please God? That's where we started out. God chose, chose the individual to be a soldier. And a soldier cannot entangle himself in the affairs of this life. What's that mean? We don't vote? No, that's not what it means. You vote and you vote for the candidate that has Christian values. Whether he's a Democrat or a Republican. Whoever reflects the Christian value on that particular issue, you vote for that individual. You don't vote your party. You vote for whoever reflects it. Now, I understand that there's... I get it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't vote. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be involved in politics if God's called you to do that. What it means is you don't get involved with the stupid things and the arguments of people. Stay away from the conspiracy theories. There's a thousand conspiracy theories new every day. And you know what you do with your conspiracy theories? You spend more time and effort on your conspiracy theories than reading the Bible. I'm smart. I understand what's going on in the world. But very seldom will you hear me teach about it unless you need to know. Because the Word of God is what gives you life. The Word of God is what saves you. The Word of God is eternal. There's going to be a new conspiracy theory tomorrow, I guarantee you. You can't entangle yourself. Because this is what you're doing. You're spending your time on second-rate causes. Would you agree that the greatest cause in the world is the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, yes. Okay? So when you get yourself involved in spending your time in good causes, what you're, I'm not saying they're bad, in good causes, you're not spending your time or your calling in what God says is best. There's a difference. Okay? There's a difference. And you should be wanting to please Him and spend your time and effort and ministry that God has called you to in what is best. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou 
by them mightest war a good what? There it is. It's, it's a war. And when he was ordained, hands were laid on him and certain words were spoken over him and those prophecies. He said, remember that. Remember what you were called to. Remember what God said you're going to do. So you can war a good warfare. And when Timothy got beat up, and when P Timothy suffered persecution, and when Timothy suffered need, he didn't blame God and say, God's beating me up to humble me. God's putting me in need to um, fulfill the prophecies on me. No. He understood that this is just another day office of a soldier. It's just another day at work. Sometimes we get shot at. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we got a clear minefield. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes there's a sniper. Sometimes there's not. It's just another day at the office. And guess what? That's what you're trained to do. And after a while, you know what? It becomes second nature. At first, you're petrified. But after a while, it becomes second nature and you become what's called a veteran. And when you become a veteran of God's word, you understand that the devil is going to throw things at you. You understand that your car is going to give you problems. You understand that your boss is going to give you problems. But you don't blame God for that. If you are doing anything for God, you're engaged in battle, you think the devil's just going to sit there and say, oh, just let him go. He'll go away. No. You're a danger to the adversary. You are a problem to the adversary. You are causing ruckus in his camp. He doesn't like that. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to push back. So when he pushes back and he makes a little sickness come your way or he makes a little problem come your way, don't blame God and say, God's doing this to humble me. No. No. Because you don't understand what's going on. And that's where a lot of the church is at. You know why they're there? Because the guys behind the pulpit don't have a clue. They wouldn't know a spirit if it came up to them and said, Hi, my name is lust, or fear, or suicide, or murder. I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you the truth. Because it's the truth that will make you free. I didn't say set you free. See, you set a bird free, you can catch her again, put him back in the cage. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the truth will make you free. Like a slave who's got the paper, he's free. You can't touch me in Jesus Christ's blood. But if the slave runs away, his freedom will be taken away if he doesn't have the document. You understand? It says he will make you free. And you'll be free, you'll be free indeed. Okay? War, good warfare. That's what he said. That's what's going to happen, son. There's going to be times when you look at your friend and his leg is blown off and blood squirting out. You got to get over there and put a tourniquet on him and fill him up with morphine. And encourage him and tell him to hold on till the PJs get there. There's going to be times that this happens or that happens. You got to be there. This is what you're trained to do. You've been trained to do this. You understand? This is what it's all about. You've been trained. You know what to do. Remember your training. Well, the same thing. Same thing. That's what's Paul telling them to do. Second Timothy 3, please. A couple more verses. Second Timothy 3, verse 10. But thou... Has fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions. All that other stuff is pretty good so far, right? But now we're getting down to verse 11 to persecutions. Why you mean tell me? So you, I got to be persecuted? I didn't sign up for this. Afflictions. I'm going to be afflicted? I didn't read that in the oath I took which came to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. And what persecutions I what? Endure. You know why? Because he was a good soldier. He was a veteran. And he knew how to endure. But out of 
them all, the Lord sent more and humbled me. No. What did God do? He delivered him. Now, why would God deliver him from something that God gave him? Does God going to deliver you from Holy Spirit? No, because he gave it to you. Is he going to deliver you from Jesus Christ? No, because it's good and he gave them to you. God delivered him from the attacks. God delivered him from the persecutions. God delivered him from the afflictions that the adversary sent that came along with being engaged on the front line in war. That's what God delivered him for. I'll stand here. I'll do whatever I got to do. I'm not budging. I'm waiting on you, Lord. That's what enduring hardness is. Yay, verse 12. Look at this one. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, absolute tense, suffer what? Persecution. There it is. Hey, you all talk about the promises of God, right? Here's a promise of God for you. Put it on your refrigerator. <laughs> All that will live godly, I know you don't like, but that's the word. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer what? That's just as much of the word of God as John 3.16 is. It's a promise. Okay. But he prepares us. He equips us. He educates us. And older men and women in the word of God who have traveled this path, who have fought the good fight, are supposed to pass this down and instruct the younger people to understand what's going on and so that when it's their turn, they're not hoodwinked or blindsided. And they don't turn around and blame God for doing something that the adversary does. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And for us... And for the next generation, if the Lord should tarry, look what you got to look forward to. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being what? Deceived. deceived. It's going to get wor worse. So don't worry about it. The Bible already tells you that. Gird up your loins. Strengthen yourself. Train. Train. Rely on the Lord. He's equipped you. You're a soldier. You'll get through this. So when you get smacked upside the head, don't cry about it. Just learn how to duck. See? Strike back. Be like Samson. You know what it says? He sought an occasion with the Philistines. He didn't sit around on his duff. He said he sought an occasion. I'm going down the bar and pick me a fight with some Philistines. That's what he said. You be aggressive with the word. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the God out of temptations. You know what else he knows? How to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be rewarded. Doesn't say that. What's it say? Punished. 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 Right? I'm probably getting burned in the lake of fire. Part of that punishment. See? God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So you, temptations are going to happen in your life. Okay? When you're bebopping along and the sun is out and the birds are singing and in your Volkswagen with your little Volkswagen flowers on the side of the car, when it starts to rain and your convertible top don't go up, temptations are going to happen in your life. Okay? But God knows how to deliver. Part of deliverance is learning how to endure hardness as a good soldier. Staying put, waiting on God, doing God's will. A lot of people, when the, it gets tough, remember the saying, when it gets tough, gets going, going gets tough, whatever, the tough get going. A lot of things, when it gets tough, they run. They complain. They squawk. See? They cower. They give up. How do they cower? This is how you coward. It's okay to marry homosexuals. It's God's will. No, that's not what the word says. 
pastor. You have a 401. You've been the pastor of this church for 14 years. You got another six before you can retire. The board of elders has sat down and we have discussed this at length and in depth with our theological partners. And we all have come to the conclusion and agree that yes, it is okay to marry homosexuals in front of God. It's holy. Yeah, but that's not what the word says. Pastor, you have a family, you have children in college, you have a mortgage. Would you like to retain your position as pastor in this church? Well, yeah. And then your buddy pulls you aside and says, well, look, just lay down because you can do some good for the people in the church still. And this isn't something that you don't need to get involved with. This is an issue you don't need to get pick, pick your fights. Just let them have this. You got the whole board of elders. You got the whole denomination splitting over this. Just lay down. Compromise and keep your position. You'll still be able to teach. You'll still be able to help. You'll still be able to minister. And you start listening. You start listening. And you start. And then you know what happens. This is what happens. You become meow. That's the nicest way I can say it. That was a cat, if you don't know. <laughs> and you compromise. You compromise. You don't stay steadfast. You don't allow God to pull you out of it. You don't allow them to see the hand or the power of God work. You coward. And when they got a hold of you, and they got a hold of your purse, and they got a hold of your livelihood, and they got a hold of your children, and they got a hold of your house, you know what? They got a hold of you. You ever wonder why Paul was a saddle maker? That he worked when there wasn't money there? Because he didn't want to be responsible. He didn't want to have those people responsible either. Okay? Close in Hebrews chapter 10. People have real ministries. They have real pure hearts. They have real good intentions. And then they get hooked up with the organized machinery of the church and the elders and the deacons, and the rules, and the regulations, and the bylaws, and the laws, and before you know, you're nothing but a figure. You're not operating in a ministry anymore. You're not functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit anymore. You know what you're doing? You're performing. You're going up. You're looking good. You're having a social gospel. You say a couple nice things. You acquiesce to the world. And you walk off and you shake everybody's hand at the end of the day by the door. And you go home and you do the same thing week after week after week. You want to know something? That's sad. Jesus Christ ticked them off so bad that they killed him. They killed him. But you know what Jesus Christ didn't do? He did not bend. He was not compromised. You going to kill me? that I'm going to the grave confessing God's word. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. They know not what they do. And what did he say? It's finished. There was a guy from start to finish who did it right. No one's asked you to do that. We get upset when somebody says such and such, or this or that or the other thing. Or they're going to write something bad about me on Facebook. They're going to unfriend me. Can you do that? I don't know nothing about Facebook. I only got Facebook so I go look at cars. And I don't friend nobody. And I got a picture of Alf with a big sandwich with a cat in it and him eating it as my picture. That's right. Because I don't want nobody to know who I am. That's the truth. He's on a hoagie roll, a cat. <laughs> you see? My mind is a sick place. I don't go there very often. <laughs> They're going to unfriend you? Huh? They're going to talk bad about you? They're going to say a mean thing? Huh? They're going to cancel you? They're going to cancel. Huh? They canceled Ed Sullivan. They don't cancel people.
They've been trying to cancel Jesus Christ since the day he was born. Hurry. Right. That's canceling, right? They wanted to really cancel him. Look, if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer what? Get used to it. That's the way it works. Don't squawk about it. Don't blame it on God. Get used to it. Be a good soldier. Go through that line. Kick some butt. Take some names. Don't give up. Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Don't throw it away. That which you were taught, that's what you believed, that which you had faith in. Don't cast it away. Because it has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the what? Okay? And you know what that's going to take, people? That's going to take enduring hardship as a good soldier. How long is that going to take? I do not know. It might take a week. It might take a month. It might take a year. But you know what? You don't give up. You endure hardness. You don't cast it away. Because you're patient. You patiently wait on the Lord. And God knows you're waiting and the Bible says, you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And you will receive the promise if you do not give up. Do not compromise. Listen, I'd rather be here with my wife and nobody else and have it said of me, he did not compromise on God's word. And the whole congregation can go do whatever they want. Do whatever you want. But I would rather be here with just my wife because when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account of my life, I'm going to be able to look him in the eye and say, I did the best I could. You are going to do the same thing because you're men and women of quality, because you're men and women of integrity and of honor. And you know what it takes to stand for the Lord. So having done all, you do what? Stand. Amen? Amen? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us understanding and strength. And thank you, Lord, for being able to be men and women of God, men and women with steel up our backbones, men and women that will stand in the face of accusation, in the face of persecution. And thank you that we can be loving and not judgmental and not puffed up with knowledge either, Father. That doesn't kick it either. But we can just understand and be straight on your word, and steadfast. And I thank you for all these wonderful things and these wonderful people and your word in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And remember, if we are shut down for some type of censorship reason, you can always check out our videos at www cvm.church. Thank you for your patronage. This was brought to you by Chapter and Verse Ministry. Love is of God. If you love, you're born of Him. Love Washed away the multitude of sin.